I do believe that reading aloud to our children is the number one thing that we as parents should be doing with our children. Hello everyone, welcome back. We are on the last chapter of Jim Trelease's Read Aloud Handbook. I've just loved going through this book and talking about it with you. So this last chapter is entitled The Do's and Don'ts of Reading Aloud. And I just wanted to share a few points that they had in this. It's not a very long chapter, but it does give you some really, really good advice about how to get started with this. Because if you're brand new to it and you have older kids, or if you're listening to this and you've got babies or toddlers at home, home and and you're like I haven't really made this a routine in our life yet and so how in the world do I get started with this the first thing that they say is just to start simple start with picture books that have very few words in them at first and then gradually you can start to get picture books that have uh, more words and then you can get into the early chapter books and then you can get into bigger chapter books and then novels so you just have to have that slow gradual process don't try to just jump in with a novel right away or there are picture books that have a lot of words in them and you don't have to start out with those you can start out very very simply Some of our favorite books, especially with my younger ones, are the Mo Willems Elephant and Piggy books. And these books are perfect because not only are they super entertaining and fun, but they have very few words. These books, the illustrations really tell the majority of the story. So when you're reading this book, there are very few words. It's all dialogue between the two characters, Elephant and Piggy. But the expressions and and what's going on in the very simple illustrations really tells most of the story. So you can be reading this and then you can be asking your kids, what is that look on Piggy's face? What is she thinking? Or, oh my goodness, what's happening? Look, it's raining. Oh, why why did it stop raining on, on Piggy all of a sudden? Oh, it's because Elephant has his ear over her. So it really didn't stop raining. He's just shielding her from the rain. So those are perfect for when you don't want to have to read a whole lot of words, but it's still super entertaining and you can discuss a lot of things without there needing to be a lot of words. Other books that we like that don't have a lot of words but are really good stories is um, Corduroy is one of my kids' favorites. And Don Freeman, we have multiple of his books in our home. He's just a phenomenal writer. And Corduroy is just, again, the illustrations are beautiful and the story is so sweet. There's not a lot of words. It's not a hard read, but it's just one of our favorites because of the story. Other books, if you have like toddlers or preschoolers at home, um, Mr. Brown Can Moo is a really excellent book by Dr. Seuss because it has all of these sounds in it. And if you are an expressive reader, which we'll get to later, um, then it can be super memorable for your kids because it's all of these sounds that different things can make. So if you get really expressive, then it'll become memorable. And then after a while, your kids will know all of the sounds and they will put the sounds in for you. You don't have to read all of the words anymore. The next thing that they say is to read a variety of books with your kids. So don't just read a whole lot of fiction books with your kids. You can also read nonfiction and you can read poetry, read long books and read short books, read wordless books. All of those things are going to keep your kids interested. And everybody likes a variety of things to read. So switch it up. Don't always read the exact same things to your kids. Try something new and see if they like it. The next thing that they suggest, which is so important that I cannot stress enough, is cater to your kids' interests when it comes to picking out books. So if you've got a child who is super into animals, then go find lots of different picture books about animals or let your kids browse the stacks at the library themselves and pick out books. I'll tell you this story. My daughter who is seven, if you've been around for a while, um, you might already know that she loves animals. And for a while there, she had this huge 
obsession with big cats like lions and leopards and cheetahs and mountain lions and panthers. She loved all of them. And we got books from the library, like nonfiction books about those so that she could learn more about them and get really good facts about those animals. But then she also really likes the fiction books about them. And recently she went to the library and found this book about Cecil the lion, which is a true story about a lion in Africa that was being protected by this wildlife preserve group organization. I can't really remember exactly, but he ended up getting killed by poachers. And um, I think that the the organization tried to um, get those people prosecuted because he was supposed to be in a safe area that was completely um, natural and in the natural environment and habitat of those lions. So they were not kept in captivity, but there was a safe area for them away from poachers. But what ended up happening was the poachers lured the lion out of that safe place and ended up killing it. And so it was a very sad story, but it was a true story that my daughter really loved. And she picked that out off the shelf herself. I didn't even find that book for her. And there have been multiple other books about lions that ended up being true stories that she just loved and picked out herself. So don't underestimate your kids' ability to find the books that they want on the shelf. Let them pick them up and try them out. And I've done that with some of my other kids too. I know that my second son is super into Legos and he's super into Star Wars and they have Star Wars Legos books. And so I'm always um, looking for those different books on the shelves and he actually goes straight to those shelves when we go to the library because he knows exactly where that section is and we also like to go to the new books section at our library there's always new books that are coming out and we're always finding those and he's found so many awesome books about lego star wars and just about legos in general or star wars in general so he will go and and pick those out too my oldest son is super into weather and so i'm constantly trying to find books about meteorology and severe weather and and he really likes to look at maps and atlases because those talk about the different climate areas areas in different parts of the world and so he enjoys all of that and so I'm looking for those as well and then my last daughter my youngest who is four really really loves um, books that have to do with the tv shows that she's watching and I cater to that I let her pick out those books she loves Paw Patrol books and Puppy Dog Pal books and recently um, she really likes Barbie books so I will go find those for her I'll let her get those books and check those out because that's what she's interested in right now. Another suggestion that they have is find out more about the author. So whenever we read a book, I'm always reading the title on the front of the book. So I'll say, The Pigeon Finds a Hot Dog, Pictures, Words and Pictures by Mo Willems. And if there's an illustrator, which, you know, it's a, if it's a separate illustrator, then I'll read that as well. But then most of the time, these authors have websites and you can find out more about them, like where they're from and, you know, what they, you know, how they got started being an author. Recently, we read this book called Up in the Leaves by Shira Boss. And I, this was a true story about a man who lived in New York who built tree houses in the trees of Central Park. So I looked her up because I thought it was fascinating. Or usually on the back um, cover of the books, they will have a little description of the author and how this came about. So I looked her up. Shira Boss is a writer who lives in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, three blocks from N New York Central Park. Up in the Leaves is her second book. She earned undergraduate and graduate degrees from Columbia University, including a master's in journalism. When her Japanese maple tree needed pruning, several people suggested she call arborist Bob Redman. He said it was the smallest tree he has ever worked on, about four feet in a pot. Now they have two sons, two whippets, and many more trees. So she ended up marrying him. I thought that was the best story. You really want to find out more about the authors of the books that you are reading with your kids. Not always. You don't have to always go into great detail. But I'll tell you, when at the very, very beginning of the pandemic in 2020, Mo Willems, who I was already a huge fan of, 
somehow I found out that he was doing live streams of drawing lessons with kids. So he wanted to give them something to do while they were all stuck at home, doing remote learning, always just staying inside and not seeing anyone. We hopped on. I can't, I feel like it was only the first week of the pandemic when everything was shut down. But every day he got on there. I feel like it was a Facebook Live or something. And he showed us how he draws his characters, mostly the elephant and piggy characters, but he also uh, showed us how he draws the pigeon. And then he also took us on a tour of his studio in his home where he draws and where he writes. And he showed us um, all these different drawers that he keeps all of his illustrations in and like different copies of his books. It was fantastic. It just made me appreciate Mo Willems that much more to put that face and that voice with the pictures and the the name on these books was just fantastic i loved how much he cared about catering to the kids during that time that is something that i will never forget so I definitely encourage you to look up the authors of the books that your kids love to find out more about them. I ended up looking up more um, about Lincoln Peace, Lincoln something. I can't remember how to pronounce his name, but he's the one who writes the Big Nate books that my boys are so, so obsessed with. For many, many years, they've read his books, and so I wanted to find out more about him. Uh Ah, so apparently you pronounce his last name as Purse. So Lincoln Purse is an American cartoonist best known as the creator of the successful Big Nate comic strip, which has also been collected and published Big Nate comic strip collections. So the strip debuted in 1991 in 135 newspapers and currently has a client list of over 400 newspapers worldwide. Lincoln Purse is also the author illustrator of a series of Big Nate novels for young readers. He's written a number of animated shorts that have appeared on Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon and is the creator of the Big Nate animated series as well as the series of Big Nate activity books. So it's always good to know more about the authors of your favorite books. So go ahead and look that up. I think it's wonderful. The next thing that I would suggest to you, just from personal experience over almost 13 years of reading with my children, is do not expect them to sit perfectly still or to listen perfectly quietly to your entire book. It's just not going to happen. So don't get frustrated when that does not happen. So give your kids things to do with their hands if they like to draw or scribble or color or if they like to build quietly with Legos or play with Play-Doh quietly while you're reading, give them something to do with their hands. They're probably going to have to stop you and ask for a snack or water during your story. That's just going to happen. They're going to interrupt to ask questions or to make comments. Don't shush them and keep reading give them that moment to make that comment or to ask a clarifying question give them time for that answer their question or ask them well i don't know what do you think or let them have their comment and respond to it give them that time another thing that they suggest is to stop and discuss things about the illustrations or ask what they think will happen next So I love that, that it's not just you constantly reading while your children are constantly listening. It is an experience that both of you can have together. So if you can say, look at this, look at what they're doing in that picture, what's happening? And let them be a part of that discussion. Listen, let them talk for a while. Or I love asking my kids, what do you think is going to happen? and then letting them voice their opinions or thoughts about that. It's so important. The next thing that I suggest is be animated. These books from Mo Willems are meant to be read expressively. There are deep and loud thoughts going on here. There is anger, there's exasperation, there's joy and excitement. So read expressively with your kids. Your kids will get so much more out of it than you reading in monotone. And it takes practice. You're not going to be perfect at it at first, but just just keep trying little by little each time that you read a book with your kids. And one other thing that they say that I'll read straight from the book is that remember that reading aloud comes naturally to very few people. 
So do it to do it successfully and with ease, you must practice. So sometimes you're going to stumble over your words. Sometimes you're going to not do the voices correctly if you do any voices at all. Sometimes you're going to get to a word that you don't know how to pronounce. Sometimes your mouth is going to get dry and you're going to need to drink some extra water. That's just going to happen. And so you have to practice. And I've been reading aloud to children for a very, very, very long time, since I began babysitting at the age of 14, 15 years old. So it takes practice, and if you're not used to it, don't worry about being not so great at it at first. The last thing that um, they suggest uh, is to set aside at least one consistent time of day to read aloud. And I think you're not always going to get to reading aloud during the day because sometimes the day is really busy. Our consistent time to read aloud is at bedtime. That's just how it's been since my oldest was an infant, and that's how we've always kept it. Now, we do read aloud during the day as well at different times, but sometimes we're busier than others and we don't get to those books during the day. But my kids know. They expect it every single night at bedtime. We do not skip that unless it's been a really late night or we've had a movie night that we stay up super late for even then they're like wait a minute you're not going to read us a book before we go to sleep it's just how they end up winding down at night and that's what they expect so if bedtime is not your jam because you are you're all just so exhausted at the end of the day i realize that it might be really hard to muster the energy to read a book for 10 minutes with your kids at bedtime so maybe the best time for you to read aloud to your kids is first thing in the morning when they're all eating breakfast you can be they're all going to be sitting at the table anyway they're all going to have their mouths full of food so maybe they won't talk as much and then you could just pick up a book and read some to them then or if during lunchtime is better for you. If you've gotten started with your day and now you're all eating lunch, you could read aloud during that time. If afternoon during your baby's nap time is easier for you, then do it then, but at least set aside one consistent time of day to read aloud with your kids. Just start there. There are a couple of things in this chapter where they say, don't do this. All right, so I think these are super important too. So the first thing is don't keep reading a book if no one is enjoying it. There's this quote that I heard a long time ago that I live by myself when I'm reading books to myself, which is, life is too short to read books you don't like. The same is true for your kids too. If you're reading a book and none of your kids are interested to continue, Uh, then don't continue it. We did this a few times last year with um, chapter read-alouds that I was trying out with the kids. None of them were enjoying it. So we tried a couple of chapters, and then I was like, all right, we're going to move on to the next book. There's no reason to continue a book. Just because you started it does not mean you have to finish it if no one is enjoying it. So keep that in mind. Go ahead and move on to the next book that you all will enjoy. The next thing they say is don't confuse quantity with quality. Reading to your child for 10 minutes with your full attention and enthusiasm may very well last longer in your child's mind than two hours of solitary television viewing. So you might think to yourself, well, if I read, then it's going to take us like at least 30 minutes. You know, it's so tiring. There's so much. I don't know if my kids are going to have enough attention span for that. If I can't read for 30 minutes, I just can't read to them at all. That's not true. You could read one or two books or three books if they're short picture books and that'll last 10 minutes that's just as good as if you were reading to them for 30 minutes but you've lost everybody's attention after 10 minutes and then you're still making them sit and listen to you. So make sure that you realize that 10 minutes a day is still valuable reading time. The last thing that they say is don't use a book as a threat. So what they mean by that is if you say, if you don't clean this this room up, then no story tonight. Never use book reading time with your kids as a punishment. Never take that away. Take away other things because the reading should always be the thing that you do with your kids. Take away TV time. 
take away, you know, talking to their friends or something, but don't take away the reading time. So the second half of this book is filled with lists of book recommendations. And this is one of the reasons why I absolutely love this book. I love a good book list. So they have broken it down into different categories and the categories are wordless books, predictable books, stories with rhyming verse, picture books, early chapter books, chapter books and novels, nonfiction, and poetry. I highly encourage you to buy this book or check it out from the library and try out their suggestions. As you keep trying out new books, you'll get a feel for what books your kids like and which ones that you like to read aloud. So this is a very, very good starting point because you might be asking yourself, okay, I have listened to all of these episodes of you discussing the read aloud handbook. I understand the the value and the benefits of reading aloud to my kids, but I don't know which books to pick out. I don't know which ones are good and which ones are junk. Like, how in the world do I get started? That's why this whole second half of this book is filled with book suggestions from babies all the way to high schoolers. So you'll be able to get a recommendation for any of those. I also have book lists on my website, which I will leave the link to in the description of this uh, episode. But these are all books that I have read and loved with my kids year after year. So you can start out with those as well. This ends the series of episodes dedicated to Jim Trelease's Read Aloud Handbook. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go back and listen to all of the episodes. I said at the beginning of this series that I read this book for the first time right before I even had my own children. I was already an avid reader and I had come from a home where my mother read aloud to us kids and our our family dynamic encouraged reading books. And we had routine um, library trips where I got to go and pick out any books that looked interesting to me. So I already knew that reading books to my kids was going to be a part of our lifestyle. But then after I read this book, I was able to, you know, I saw the research that showed all the areas that reading aloud touched and benefited. Not only does it help children academically by introducing vocabulary, modeling fluency, demonstrating expressive reading, developing comprehension, and assisting children in making connections, it also helps them socially. Reading about situations that you might come across later in life and that sparking a discussion about it. It will also satisfy our kids' interest in different topics. Like I said at the beginning, if they love animals, if they love a certain sport or a time period in history or severe weather or Legos, they can learn more about those things that they love through books. Lastly, but not any less important, it creates a bond between the parent and child like no other experience can. Australian author Mem Fox is quoted at the beginning of this chapter saying, we connect through minds and hearts with our children and bond closely in a secret society associated with the books we have shared. And I just absolutely love that. I hope that you have enjoyed this series. If you have any questions about this book or any other tips that you would like about reading aloud, then you can always um, leave them in the comments. You can always email me directly with those questions as well. My email is beth at bethpavlik.com. I would love to connect with you and help you get started with this because I do believe that reading aloud to our children is the number one thing that we as parents should be doing with our children to help them through anything in life. Whether they need to learn things, whether they need to uh, understand different situations, whether they need to have empathy for people who are not like them, uh, anything in between, any of those, um, you can get it through reading aloud with your kids. So I hope that you learned something new and have been inspired by this. Thank you so much for listening today.